Okay, so I've been testing my Corsair Vengeance DDR5 memory sticks that I got for the Corsair DDR5 overclocking competition at earlier part of this year. I wanted to see what kind of numbers could these uh, memory sticks reach on uh, like air and water cooling for like daily use, like 24 seven settings, find out the best two sticks of the sticks that I got and to see what kind of numbers could they reach. I've been testing these settings for like three days now. It has been pretty intensive and I'm actually quite a bit tired. But eventually, although very barely, I managed to run and pass ATI mem test with roughly uh, 7,000 mega transfers per second. And the highlight is obviously at the timing table. So CAS31, yes, odd CAS latency, which does work on the Z690 Dark Kimpin. 39, 39, 32, and command rate 1. Command rate 1 is quite rare at this kind of memory frequency, but I've been generally pretty successful with command rate 1 up to like 7200 pretty constantly. But yeah, let's take a very quick look at these uh, numbers with the capture card and then uh, talk a little bit about like DDR5 memory at the time of making this video. And okay, here are the actual numbers themselves. So uh, I didn't actually use memory multiplier of 7000. I tried to mess around with uh, like uh, lower multiplier and play with RTL, etc. Because 7000 was so on the edge. 6933 is rock solid, but 7000 is very on the edge. So uh, this result was achieved with a base clock of 101 megahertz. So CPU P cores were running at 5350. E cores with a multiplier of 40, so 4 something gigahertz, and cache at 4443. And memory was at 7000 megatransfers per second, 31, 39, 39, 32, and common rate 1. Most of the sub timings were left at auto, only just a few ones were set manually, like for example TRFC. But uh, for best performance, you would want to set at least the important ones manually. Like for example, uh, refresh interval has huge impact on ADA64 latency score, for example. So I, these three are heavily tied to the CPU frequency as well, but uh, the latency is heavily affected by those timings. So a good value at 7000 on the latency score would be something like 48 nanoseconds or 49. And the refresh interval, if you max it out there, the highest one is the best one. If you max it at 262,143, it will give a very nice boost in ADA64 latency, for example. Voltage for this uh, frequency was between 1.48 and 1.5. So close to 1.5, I think it's still somewhat safe, but it's definitely already in the high zone. So I wouldn't run 1.5 volts 24-7, at least with naked memory sticks, if you don't have very active airflow towards the memory, because the memory does actually heat up if it's uh, stressed a lot, and especially if it's stressed in high capacities. You can see the SPD hub temperature to go up pretty rapidly, actually. So uh, if you want to run these, like, uh, these voltages, like 1.5 and so on, I would recommend you have at least some kind of heat sinks on your memory. But uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. So uh, pretty happy that I could run common rate one. So especially common rate one at 7000. You don't see common rate one very often at this high uh, memory frequency, but I have been pretty successful with common rate one up to 7200 pretty constantly. At least when running like benchmarking settings like cast latency of 27 or 29 and these two at 37 or 39. I have generally been pretty successful with common rate one, even up to 7200. After that, it starts to get pretty hard. And uh, with DDR5, common rate two isn't that slow actually. So the difference between common rate one and two is actually quite small uh, on this generation. Of course, if the numbers are roughly the same, I would still choose common rate one, of course, but it's actually pretty close this time around. So I just wanted to point that out. But now I'll switch back to the uh, camera view and I want to say a few words what I think about like DDR5 and uh, like about buying DDR5 and overclocking at this stage of DDR5's lifespan at the time and at the time of making this video. 
So the main purpose of this testing was to sort the best two sticks of the Corsair Vengeance 6200 Cas 36 uh, sticks that I got. So uh, it's this kit over here. So uh, Corsair Vengeance DDR5, 32 gigabytes, so 2x16, 6200, and it's Cas 36. So it should be marked somewhere over here. So Cas 36 at uh, 6200. Now, uh, what I found out during this testing was, well, it has already been pointed by Buildsoid, for example, but uh, it doesn't really matter that much how good your memory kit is up to a point. So, uh, when I was testing uh, these kits, and this CPU does actually have pretty okay IMC, it's not the best, but it's not like complete crap either. When I was testing these kits on the G7400, the uh, Rockstar CPU, I couldn't run HEI memtest stable, like fully stable, at memory frequency any higher than 6200 to 6300. I tried any, I tried many different combinations, different voltages, etc. It would just crash very early on in HEI memtest, and even like uh, test stylish settings, they wouldn't often even post and boot at 6600 or 6800 something. And when I switched to 1200K. The settings are rock solid on every possible kit up to like 6933 and 7000 plus. So uh, it actually seems that with these Hynix based kits, the CPU's IMC and the motherboard itself has a lot bigger impact on the overall overclocking result than the memory kit itself. So uh, I, when I was testing these kits, even my oldest DDI5 kit, which is uh, a very basic G Skill Ripsaws S5. Uh, 6,000 6, mega transfers per second and cast latency of 40. Even this kit, which is relatively cheap on the market right now, it can post and boot 7,200 mega transfers per second with uh, cast latency of 31 and 32. And uh, of course, it's not stable at those settings, but it can at least post and boot 7,200 and it can run HCI mem test fully stable at 6,800. To 6933 plus and even close to 7000. So uh, it feels kind of weird that if you buy, let's say, like a 250 euro Hynix based kit, you will receive near roughly the same end result for daily overclocking and like 24 7 use as a very expensive, like 450 euro to 500 euro high end performance kit, like for example, the G Skill Trident Z5. 6600 CAS 34 and even the uh, uh, Trident Z5 6400 CAS 32 which I have been using a lot on my recent videos. So it's this one over here with custom uh, bits power heat sinks. These memory sticks are very awesome. They have been able to run uh, tests like Geekbench uh, 3 etc. with very good timings even above DDR5 8000 mega transfers per second when the sticks themselves and the CPU have been cooled on LN2, like uh, very cold temperatures and relatively high voltages, like 1.65 to 1.7. But uh, this was just my finding when it comes to like full capacity stability. So they are roughly the same. So uh, if you buy, let's say, like a four slot motherboard you might actually be better off with Samsung-based DDR5 memory. So if your memory frequency is very limited to, let's say, like 6400, Samsung-based memory can be actually pretty good. Like when I tested the Dominator Platinum RGP, they could run HEI mem test fully stable with a timing table of like 35, 36, 36, 28 common rate. One at 6400. Some of the timings are a lot tighter than on Hynix-based kits like especially TRCD and TRP, only the cast latency is, itself is uh, tighter on Hynix. And uh, yeah, uh, Buildtroid already mentioned this very heavily, this time around with DDR5, two slot motherboard design, so single slot per channel motherboard design is very important for memory overclocking. It started with uh, Samsung BDI on DDR4, back during the DDR3 days, Two slot versus four slot didn't have much in, uh, like uh, effect on memory overclocking. Like uh, the end part of DDR3, the only difference between two slot and four slot design was that two slot design could run maybe one value tighter RTL, so run free latency. Very minimal differences, next to nothing pretty much. 
With DDR4 and Samsung B die, it started to make a huge difference once again. The difference got smaller towards the end of DDR4, like Z490, Z590. Some of the 4 slot motherboards could actually overclock even B die quite well. And now with DDR5, it seems to matter tremendously once again. So you can run those very high frequencies of 7000 and beyond on four slot motherboard designs. But even with those, like for example now with the Z690 Dark Kimbin, of course my CPU might be still behind on IMC quality, so maybe some other CPU could run 7200, maybe 7400 daily stable. But with this IMC, and I guess this is quite like uh, common, this kind of IMC in terms of quality, I cannot get any uh, real difference between a very cheap DDR5 kit or well not very cheap but somewhat affordable DDR5 kit and a very expensive DDR5 kit. So uh, that's just what I wanted to mention. So uh, you can reach very good numbers even with like a 250 to 300 euro memory kit like pretty much rock solid and top tier performance. But yeah, so uh, these are the results. So uh, common rate one at 7,000 for Z690 Kimpin and some of my own like ideas and findings about DDR5 and daily overclocking. So uh, hope you, hopefully you like to see this video, subscribe to my channel and thanks for watching and I will see you on the next one.